Yeah, you're live. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Bangkok for our Travel Massive meeting tonight. And we are also live on Travel Massive over Facebook and streaming around the world. As many of you know, Travel Massive is an industry networking group for travel professionals. There's over 50,000 people on the network in over 180 countries. We also have 150 real life chapters in the world, just like this one in Bangkok. And just to FYI, to give you an idea, we have events this week around the world in Lisbon, Manchester, Munich, London, and Toronto. My name is Rick Gazarian. I'm the Travel Massive chapter leader here in Bangkok and also the Asia coordinator. I'm excited to be hosting this panel tonight. We have three local entrepreneurs in the tourism space. I'm going to jump right in and let them give a brief introduction. We're going to start here on my left. And Matt, please give us a quick introduction of yourself and let me travel. The mic would help. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so my name is Matt Mayer. Um, I'm originally from England, although I spent the last 15 years in Asia, in India, um, China and now Thailand. Um, and the last two years I've been the CTO of a travel startup called Lemi, L-E-M-I. Um, uh, what Lemi is, is a, an app where people can uh, create and share recommendations in different cities around the world. So uh, typically on different themes. So I might make a list of my favorite sushi restaurants in Tokyo or the best world heritage sites in the world. And we make it really easy for people to kind of uh, explore and add their wish lists on the app and then create a travel plan and then go. Next up we have Johnny Ward. Hey guys, uh, my name is Johnny, I'm from Ireland. Um, originally I was a blogger and I met Rick through my journeys to every country in the world. Since then, um, two of my colleagues are in the audience, we started a social enterprise called Medita Adventures, formerly Give Back Giveaway, we're in the process of a rebrand. And we essentially marry the idea of adventure travel in countries like Pakistan and Sri Lanka around the world with sustainable development. So where other companies would use their profit margin from the, for their ticket sales to drive a Ferrari around Bangkok, we use it for projects like malaria clinics and playgrounds and classrooms and things like that. So I'll pass it on. And next up we have Michael from Bangkok Vanguards. Hey everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for the invitation, for the invitation. My name is Michael. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I just had a journey behind me and I'm the most formally dressed here because <laughs> I had another uh, panel talk on the Belt and Road in Initiative by China and how it's going to impact tourism. It was quite uh, academic, but very interesting. Uh, and now, much more leisure, I enjoy that. <laughs> um, so I run a small uh, travel company in, based in Bangkok. We focus on urban experiences with uh, uh, take on taking people into you know the deeper layers of the city to dissect the complexities of urban uh, centers like Bangkok in a number of realms. So we I want to shift away from you know the attraction based towards like actual life and uh, communities, uh, vernacular heritage, um, and other aspects of urban life. And uh, so yeah, it's been a journey. We're still work in progress. Uh, got good feedback, a lot of good collaborations, um, and uh, I hope to be able to share a little bit more on that and my perspective on this marvelous place that we call here our chosen home. Excellent, guys. Thank you all for that introduction. Also want to thank Lemmy Travel as well for being the sponsor for this event. So check out their travel app and, of course, the other two companies who are on the panel as well. I had a friend of mine who was driving in West Africa a giant sandstorm came in. He had to sleep and stay underneath his car to stay safe. This was the inspiration for his travel business, which was a travel business of setting up road races around the world. Now, that's a pretty cool story. I'm not putting you guys on the spot. I'm curious to see, do you guys have an origin story? Meaning, all of you guys have three cool and unique businesses 
But was there a day where a light bulb came on or there's a catalyst or inspiration which kind of drove you or inspired you to start the business? If anybody has a story, would love to hear it. Uh, yeah, so I was in um, Nigeria and we were overlanding from Nigeria up around, around the west coast of Africa to Morocco. And Josh, my co-founder, and I, we decided that we would use my blog's following to crowdfund a sustainable development project in Senegal. So then we reached out to my followers and we said, we're trying to raise five grand. Um, and if they, could, if they donated to our charitable fund, we would draw a name out of a hat and pick one of those people and we would fly them at our expense to Senegal to see where the money would be spent and, and the good that could be done with, with microfinancing. Um, so we raised the five grand, we drew out a winner out of the hat, a girl who'd never been outside the US, eh, aside from a 10 day trip in Cancun, and she flew one way to, to Senegal to meet us. But what happened was, actually, which was really the birth of Give Back Giveaway, which is now Medita, um, lots of the people who donated, once they hadn't won the free trip, they contacted us and they said, Josh, Johnny, we just want to come on the trip. We want to see what can be done with the money in that country and we want to travel with you guys on this adventure. So I think seven people who hadn't won the trip asked could they pay to come. So we had never run trips or anything before and we were like, uh, yeah, okay, sure. And then we, had, we were speaking with the local NGO that we were partnering with in Senegal and we said, listen, we've got seven other people who want to join. Can they come as well? And he said, yep, sure. And we had no idea what to charge, so we, we made up a price of $999 for the two-week trip, which in the end wasn't enough, and we had to subsidize it ourselves because we had no idea what we were doing. But for the $999, we had no company registration, we had no website, it was all through my blog. The way that we accepted the $999 was we had to speak to the people who wanted to come to our trip from the USA, from Canada, from the UK, and we had to say, okay guys, it's $1,000, can you please send the money to Mr. Yassin Diallo? That's the Bank of Senegal in Dakar, thanks. And seven of them sent the money and they trusted us. And that was really the first trip that we run, with that we had run, which was a bit of a chaotic mess, but it gave birth to the next year we did two trips, then four, then eight, and next year is 12. So that was our first trip that we managed to run. Anybody else have a story they want to share or should I go to the next question? No, I mean, I can quickly share it. <clears throat> so I moved to the Bangkok 16 years ago, uh, age 23, but prior to that, I always, as a teenager, because my mom's Thai, so it uh, opened up a whole new, you know, uh, dimension to, you know, uh, my cultural roots, basically, visiting family here in Thailand. And for me, as a young person, uh, I was always, you know, captivated by the energy. In the 90s, Bangkok was just like, even wilder than it is today, and I always wanted to understand how does it compare in size to Düsseldorf? <laughs> or Cologne, right? And uh, to the point, actually, my obsession was Bangkok, uh, that, that I could draw the map when I was bought in class by heart, and that was always my thought here. And then eventually, 23, I moved here, uh, exploring. Of course, you know, the, the main, major thing I knew. So I explore in the areas that are usually not on the radar. Uh, I love urban exploration, abandoned places, whether it was the abandoned high rises of the 1997 crisis or the microcosms under the expressways or the rail tracks. And it was not just the urban environment, but because I speak Thai, um, I, I saw that there's, no, there's human life, uh, actually, and not just a few people, but thousands of people living in these harsh urban environments and uh, talking to these people and understanding uh, you know, what's actually going on apart from you know, the shiny uh, uh, facades of our city. Um, so I wanted to understand that deeper and I uh, got a lot of inspiration by local initiatives that uh, try to, you know, better the circumstances for the communities and I wanted to share that with a wider audience. So I took exchange students, expats, on walks in collaboration with uh, the Bion Petit Foundation from Derry to raise awareness and, you know, to allocate resources then uh, towards their projects um, and uh, other initiatives that would be too many now to elaborate on. But this, this is basically the beginning, like seeing a human condition, getting more curious about it and uh, it took a while until I actually realized that, you know, to scale this, I actually have to build a team and be financially sustainable and, you know, uh, go on and try to go on an entrepreneurial path, right? So, that's my story. Excellent. Okay, guys, I want to switch topics for a moment. I want to talk about client acquisition. And from what I know about your three companies, we have three different animals on stage. 
I'm going to st start with Matt at Lemmy, Lemmy, so if you can pass the, the mic down. So if I understand your app correctly, you're almost looking for acquisition of two different types of people. One, you want customers to be using your app to get suggestions and advice when they're traveling. And then you're also looking for content creators to be providing information to add to your travel app as well. So talk about what's working, what's not. What are the challenges of building up scale on the app and gathering these people to be utilizing Lemmy? Um, so yeah, that's an interesting question. And I think um, for any, particularly any digital product like we're building an app, um, if you're following a kind of a modern agile methodology, you are typically going to identify certain metrics, right, which you which you care about. Um, and there is a tendency for people to choose like vanity metrics, things that don't actually matter, things like how many Instagram followers you have, or um, you know your your reach on on a Facebook post. There are only two metrics which matter when you're making a digital product, and that is user acquisition and user retention. How many new users do you manage to get onto your platform? And do you keep them? What percentage of people who you recruit to your platform actually keep using the app like one week later or one month later or three months later? Everything else is pure vanity. So we, like, our team spends nearly all of their time figuring out how do we attract new people to use Lemmy and how do we keep them using it? How do we keep them sticky? So, so to actually answer the question, like, how do we attract new users? Um, you, you certainly need a big variety of approaches. No one strategy will work. Um, so we do a combination of things. We do advertising, we do um, Google AdWords on particular targeted um, keywords, we do Facebook ads on targeted keywords and Instagram ads. With all of those you need to do an awful lot of like um, iteration to, make, to figure out the keywords that are going to work for you, the exact ad text and so on. Um, but you can't ignore things like Google and Facebook, they are a large source of potential traffic but you have to spend your money smartly. Um, what we're also doing is combining that with a lot of offline work. Um, so our, we have an office in Manila, which is where most of our team is based. I work remotely here from Bangkok. Um, and we, look, we partner with um, like local businesses as well as like small to medium enterprises. So if we have, let's say, we're working with a, a co-working space in Manila, and we try to get maybe 100 of their um, people working there all using Lemmy together, um, that has a couple of advantages. Obviously, it's easier than attracting people one by one, but also if you can get kind of a, a, a niche group of people or using a social platform together, then you start to have those network effects. Because uh, people only like using social platform when they already have friends on there. So you, you can't just kind of blanket the whole world. You have to maybe start in one city or one, com one company and kind of build out your audience from there. Quick question, Matt. I don't know if you're able to judge this or share this. What is the best ROI for you? Is it Facebook ads? Is it Google ads? What's the best ROI when you're, you're doing an actual spend to acquire customers? Um, so far for ad spend, we found Google AdWords works well. Um, Apple search ads work quite well, but there isn't enough scale. There's not enough inventory um, for a lot of keywords unless you're doing something very general. And ad, Apple search ads are fairly expensive as well. Um, so for us so far, Google AdWords um, has, has the most potential in terms of online advertising. And one other question, any tricks or tips that you've utilized for that second metric that you mentioned, i.e. how are you keeping those people retained on the app and keeping them involved? Um, I, think, I think you need to do a lot of um, work on um, touching base with the users as, as, as often as possible. So we have a lot of like notifications built into our app. So for example, if somebody else likes one of your lists or comments one of your lists, you get a notification drawing you back to the app. Um, we're also starting work on more like gamification. So we now have a series of badges in the app. Um, so if you, uh, for example, post a list with, with a certain number of places in, or post a list about a certain place, you can win a, a digital badge. Um, so, um, yeah, I think injecting a little bit of kind of gamification into a purely content-based app can work. But again, it's gonna, it requires a lot of experimentation to see if that's something that your audience responds to. Johnny, you're up next. So, you, you need customers as well, but it's, it's a different type of customer. So, you're offering trips around the world. You set up the dates, the agendas, the country. Then you're reaching out to a global marketplace 
trying to have them sign up and go to that location on the calendar. What's worked for Give Back Giveaway in terms of getting customer signups and driving them to the countries that you've chosen for 2019 and 2020? I think for us, because actually we are perhaps the only person in the marketplace that offers genuine adventure tourism, not some generic, I know you're sponsored by them, Rick, but not some generic G Adventures tour that you do in Thailand. We're going to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are, we're the, one of the few companies that offers a genuine adventure where you can do something that people generally don't do and then combine that with uh, social development. So rather than us, when we focus our marketing efforts, we don't necessarily have to focus them on two weeks in Nicaragua, for example. We just need to sell them on the idea of coming on a really cool adventure and doing something worthwhile with your life. So as long as we can get our message that conveys the work that we do and that they would do with us, we just need to get them on, onto our website or onto our social media channels and then they, they can choose any product they want from the countries that we offer. So we don't necessarily need to target specifically for two weeks in Thailand, two weeks in Vietnam, the way other tourist, uh, tourism operations do. In terms of actually selling tickets though, we find the infinitely the most effective way to do that is via influencer outreach, both through my network and each trip that we do, we bring on YouTubers or Instagrammers where we give them a complimentary ticket and then they would share their experiences with their followers. Um, that gives a level of trust, of course, especially if the, if the influencers haven't been slinging products and fashion things for years on end and they're, genuine, they're genuinely interested in sustainable development and they're genuinely interested in true adventure travel, their audiences are, are so warm to the kind of thing that we offer. So that's how we sell probably 99% of our tickets at the moment. And actually it's funny that you talk about Facebook and Google ads because that's something we haven't spent any money on, not one dollar. Um, but as we grow now, we're doubling again next year, we'll, ha we'll have to start experimenting with that. But right now, influencer outreach has sold out every trip we've done. So a, a follow-up question on that. Everybody loves talking about social media influencers, travel bloggers. Um, it's always a hot topic. What screening processes are you utilizing before you partner with that influencer? So in other words, people are always concerned, is this travel influencer the real deal? Are these numbers real? Can they really drive business? Can they give me ROI? So what screening process is Give Back Giveaway utilizing to partner with the travel influencer? We're in a bit of a weird situation because obviously as a co-founder of Give Back Giveaway, I'm also a, an influencer, although I hate the term, um, with my blog and, and my channels that I have. So I actually know the industry quite well. I know the individuals who we invite. I, I've seen them. I'm, I'm in that first wave of bloggers that started in 2009. So anyone in the top 50 globally are, are friends or enemies of mine over the years. So we know directly who we can trust and who we can't. I do think though, in terms of ROI, I hope to God that Instagram and the, the, the flippant use of money just spent on a, one, on a post that disappears 24 hours later, I don't think there's any ROI in that at all. I think um, it's quite easy to quantify something with an email list, for example. As a blogger, that's where my loyalties lie, and I'm a big believer that you can sell a lot more tickets or products through an uh, email list that's full of warm leads that people have had to choose to, to subscribe to someone in, as opposed to there's some chick with a nice ass, I'm going to click like and move on, which is Instagram's model. But, well, let's, let's go back to that. So what has worked for you in utilizing your email list? And I believe you have a very large email list for One Step Forward, your blog, and I'm guessing you have a separate email list for Give Back Giveaway. So what's working for you to capture those emails, and then what works for you to get the clicks, and the engagement once you send out the emails to your email list? For people who don't know about blogging and bloggers making money or influencers making money, basically the rule of thumb is that for every, uh, for every single email subscriber you have, you should be able to make $1 per month off that list. So if you've got 1,000 subscribers, you should be able to make $1,000. If you've got 30,000 subscribers, you should be able to make $30,000 per month. That's from a blogger perspective, not from our, our give back your way perspective. Um, and the reason that is is because people are following you not to, not to buy products, they're following you because they've seen you evolve as a blogger or as an influencer or a YouTuber or whatever. So they, they know that they can trust you or you hope that they can trust you and they hope that they can trust you. So it's just a much warmer lead and I feel like um, 
modern social media is so quick to come and go, yet companies seem so e easy. To, like I, I also work sometimes with brands on Instagram, and they just throw money at you, no contract, no no uh, uh, confirmation of, of any ROI, and they just throw money at you and move along, which is a shame because I think it's a massive waste of money. But I'll take it if they're giving it. Better to be better to be the one cashing <laughs> the checks than writing them. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, Michael from Bangkok Vanguards. Uh, same question, but I believe, again, you have a different version of customer acquisition. Most of your products and tours are offered within Bangkok. So I'm guessing you're looking for people who happen to be traveling to Thailand and then being able to market your products to these incoming tours who are coming to Khrung Tep. So how does that work? What's working? What's not? What's easy? What's challenging? <laughs> okay. I always compare myself as in, you know, I'm, you know, if you have a factory, you manage the machines, you send on a conveyor belt, you know, you pack the packages, you know, you run to the truck, you deliver the package, you know, and back to the office and all that. So I don't, I, I, you know, I didn't do much marketing, to be honest. So most of how we acquire our appliances, my mom walks door to door back in Germany, you know, knocks on doors, hey, my son has got a toilet company. Um, no, um... Uh, word of mouth. I would say two thirds come word of mouth. Um, we got very good um, TripAdvisor reviews thanks to the team, uh, and, uh, and I think that is a very strong point that we got this support base. Um, Sixty percent again, I guess, are from Germany. The rest international, um, but we get like an awesome support base back in Germany, and uh, that helps us keep afloat. And uh, but of course, you know, I have to keep up with the entrepreneurial mindset and uh, look at you know the back end of my website and say like meta text isn't that <laughs> and everything is empty so SEO and all that you know we haven't done anything we don't have an email list we haven't we just after five years of business we finally printed our first brochures <laughs> and so because we are mostly in the trenches uh, and yeah so but I hope we will catch up so from my understanding trip advisor ratings can be a big generator in terms of getting business. So do you have any mechanisms in place at Bangkok Vanguard? In other words, um, is there a follow-up email to the client saying, you know, we hope you had a great trip with us. If possible, rate us on TripAdvisor. Is there a um, catalyst with the tour guides? Like, hey guys, whoever's name gets mentioned at TripAdvisor, um, review gets a t-shirt, make sure you ask your clients at the end of the tour to please rate us. Any mechanisms in place like that to drive more TripAdvisor ratings? Yeah, I mean, we have all these ideas and the plans, you know, to do this customer relations management and creating databases, follow-ups, and, you know, maybe send some messages on New Year's and all that. But uh, we are two people in operations full-time, me and Sunny, but we are based both also tour guides. We both have a tour guide license, so we run the tours themselves. Then we have another client base where we move into uh, which is more in the field of education. So we work a lot with universities and international organizations uh, because we tap into that realm of sustainable development a lot. Uh, so that takes up a lot of the resources that we have, which takes away on this classical, you know, customer relations management aspect. So we need to hire. Now we are looking actually for managers, you know, to help us out on that front. Drop off your resumes to Michael before we leave tonight. Um, I have a whole list of questions here. I'm going to ask one more, and then I'm hoping in the audience there might be some questions, so I'd love to engage with you guys as well. And I'm going to kind of segue from your last point that you made. It sounds like you have a lot of potential at Bangkok Vanguards, that you're not using a lot of these traditional marketing techniques that might grow your business 10, 20, 50%. The team is too small. You guys are stretched. So my question is, if I have the numbers correct, the three guys on stage represent organizations from roughly four to 16 employees slash workers. So how are you acquiring talent? How are you retaining talent? How are you training people? Is it difficult finding um, people who can do the jobs? So we'll have to hear from any of you or all of you. We'll start, we'll start off with Matt from Lenny Travel App. So I'm probably on the higher end of that range. So we currently have about 16 people um, working at Lenny. Um, it's, it probably depends on the role. So for example, technical roles are a lot harder to fill than let's say a marketing role. Um, 
firstly, I think you've got to have a global approach. So for example, our, our founder is based in Hong Kong. I work remotely from Bangkok. Uh, we have a bunch of people in, our, in a physical office in Manila. We also have, for example, freelancers in other countries. I have a, an Android developer in Pakistan. I have an iOS developer in the Netherlands. Um, for a lot of these roles where the, the demand outstrips the supply, you have to be willing to hire people where they want to live. Um, and you have to set up your company in a way that people can work remotely. Um, I think the days where everybody works in a single office um, are behind you, certainly for technical roles. Um, so definitely be open to hiring um, in, in, from non-traditional um, places. Um, be open you know, to not requiring certain qualifications. Be open to people who maybe have families, um, who want to work at weird hours of the day and that sort of thing. Um, don't expect people who everyone wants to work from nine to five from a physical office. Um, and then the other thing I think is when you're hiring, it's a lot easier when, you, when you're hiring something where you know how to do that job yourself. Um, it's tough if you're a non-technical co-founder and you're trying to hire for technical positions, that's extremely difficult. Um, if you don't know much about marketing and you're trying to hire a marketing person, that's very difficult. So to a certain extent, don't hire too much until you understand the roles um, well enough yourself. And when you get to the point where your ears are smoking because you just cannot handle the amount of work you have, that is the point you should hire. So, so hire when it hurts and hire roles that you, that you understand yourself because then you'll be much better at understanding what these people do. Um, and I'm the CTO, so I tend to do the technical hires. Um, we always give, I, I don't find interviews that helpful. Um, I find it much more useful to give people like a, a, an actual piece of work to do. That can be a small thing, they just take an hour or two, or it can be a longer piece of work that they get paid for over a period of time. But you cannot be actually seeing somebody doing some work and going through that with them. Whereas an interview it depends so much more on the, on the personality of the person. So we do do interviews, but that, that's not the key part of, of hiring. Mostly it's about trying to give them some kind of task uh, that we can evaluate and see how good they actually would be at the role in question. Matt, I have one quick question. You mentioned employees Netherlands, Pakistan, Philippines. Talk to us about the challenge of monitoring and managing a dispersed workforce and any tips or advice on how to monitor their progress. Um, if you want to build a remote company, but get the book called Remote by the company 37 Signals, or which is the company that made the, the web application called Basecamp. That can it describe much better than I can how to manage a remote team. Um, you, you can't hire really junior people if you're going to do a remote team. Really junior people need too much mentoring and too much hand-holding to do that. So you need to hire people with, with a bit of experience already who you can trust and who are good at reading and writing because when you are communicating with people remotely, you will spend a lot of time discussing things in written form via emails, via project management tools, via bug tracking tools, um, and less time speaking. Um, so people who can read and write well and explain their thoughts well in a written format is quite important. Um, yeah. And is, you, you mentioned Basecamp, but is there one piece of software or website that you guys stand by which is critical to your success in terms of monitoring and teamwork uh, within all these remote locations? There, there are a ton of different online project management tools. We personally use Basecamp. Um, there are other ones, let's say Asana, there's Notion. Some are free, some are paid. The important thing is to have one tool that everybody in the company uses. Um, so for us, it works well to have Basecamp. So we have designers, we have developers, we have marketing people and they discuss things on this single online platform. That keeps everything in one place. You have a historical record of what people have talked about. Things don't get lost in phone calls or emails and things like that. So it doesn't matter so much which project management tool you have, but if you do have a remote workforce, you need a online project management tool and encourage people to store all your documents, all your discussions, all your bugs, all your designs on that one platform. Awesome, thanks Matt. Johnny? I'd like to hear from you. If I understand correct, you onboarded a new employee last year, and you and Josh founded Give Back Giveaway. But talk a little bit about bringing on new employees, how that works, how difficult it is, what's the challenge? Um, yeah, it's a cliche, but finding staff is difficult. I've been hiring people for 10 years since I've been working online, and through my blog side of things, everyone's always been remote, and then 
since we've been at Give Back Giveaway, it's been the first time we've had an office and, and brought someone in directly that would be with us every day. And we've also got someone who does our tech remotely for that. And we're in the process of hiring guides and we're outsourcing our um, AdWords campaign. So yeah, it's, it's really tough, but I'm a big believer outside the tech stuff. I'm a big believer as long as someone's, I really think if anyone can, if you're, work, if you're willing to work hard, I mean really hard. I don't mean put a quote on Instagram and pretend that you're working hard. And if you're willing to work hard, I really believe that anyone can do almost any role outside any technical spec. So if it comes to sales or marketing or admin or management, I really believe that anyone can do it. I truly believe that. So when it comes to, to us hiring staff, the first thing I think, like, are they willing to suck it up, don't complain about how much work they've got to do, that we can offload the pressure that we're under to make things happen? Um, and that's the first thing I look at. And then second, I, I remember... Growing up in Ireland, um, everyone was so obsessed. This would be interesting from a tech perspective too, but um, everyone was so obsessed with going to university. And then I'm 35, so it's first thing to get a bachelor's. And then when I was about 25, it was you needed a master's. And now we're moving on to people getting their doctorates. And I'm, I'm personally now as someone who's independently successful, I think it's the biggest waste of time, you know, unless it's directly vocational. So if you're learning something tech-based, of course you need those skills. Anything else, as long as you're willing to work hard and suffer for the greater good, then you'll you'll get there in the end. Okay, I think I heard the takeaway in that. Suffer. As long as you're willing to <laughs> suffer, you can do it. Johnny, so talk to me about that. You're growing out the business. You're scaling up the business. You're hiring new people this year, next year. You have a global footprint. Where are you finding them? How are you finding them? And then how are you going to be confident and how are you going to know that these people are willing to suffer. Oh, wow, if I knew that, the team would be 20 people already. Um, it's really difficult. So how we hired our first hire was, again, through my network, through my blog, and, and through our social media. Um, as we're expanding, we'll continue to do that. We've never experienced, we've got no experience working with recruitment agencies. And when I was younger, when I, I lived in Australia working um, in an office job about 10 years ago, and they, hire, they were hiring a recruitment company and roughly the commission for a recruitment company for anyone who's worked in it in the past, they pay roughly one month salary as commission. And I used to think this was crazy. Why don't they hire in-house and save themselves five grand for every hire? And then now when you run a company or two, you understand exactly why people outsource it because it's an absolute nightmare. So to be honest, I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> so for, for the time being and what you've done in the past, in general, you are working and depending on your really large network completely okay. and, and then and then generally how i've hired in the past people would freelance to a certain extent until you realize you can trust them and then as you grow you can be like okay this is the guy or this is the girl that come on board okay so almost at some level uh what matt's doing at Wemmy, giving them a project feeling confident in their work product and then knowing whether to bring them on full time sure awesome thanks johnny so michael from bangkok vanguards same question to you. I think your team is around 10 people or so. You just, <laughs> you just shared with us that challenge that you had, that you're wearing so many different hats. It sounds like you have the real potential to be growing at a higher rate. You don't have the team big enough to be tapping on these potentials. Um, so yeah, there's like two aspects. One, we work when it comes to operations and the tours, and we hire freelance tour guides. Um, the challenge there is in Thailand, you're required to have a um, a tour guide license issued by the, uh, by the government. Um, so, and because we have we tap into the German market, we need German language as a requirement often. Uh, so, having people that are passionate, that are explorers at their heart, um, and uh, having also the tour guide license and all this is, is pretty tricky for us to find. And when it comes to full time position, it's really weird what, what I do <laughs> probably because now I just hired the person. but. It's not my operations person, I hired an anthropologist um, because we do a lot of research in the communities. And uh, I, I love people, I love learning, um, but I uh, recognize you know, that the amount of work is so much uh, that I need support. And there's a sense of urgency because maybe if you read the news, the new MRT line has opened and uh, so big developers are moving in uh, to you know, gentrify one of the last bits of historic Bangkok um, to turn it into another tourist shopping mall haven for mass tourism and the cultural heritage loss there is uh, across Bangkok in many aspects uh, is not goes unnoticed and uh, I work with 
professional photographers. I have also a full-time photographer uh, because I believe photography tells a lot of stories. Um, so he's very passionate about street photography. Um, and uh, we want to well, per, per pay tribute to the people and also document the change in, in, in the city because you know, basically the products that we, it's a product, the experience we are designing are being destroyed uh, by development because if Jaron Cromwell turns into the next Sukhumvit, what am I going to show my visitors? And I cannot just say, okay, it's gone, let's move to another place. Uh, it doesn't work for me. So at least uh, uh, I want to build a team around that, that we can keep the memories and the stories, the way of life, the heritage of the people, even digitally. Um, and uh, that's, that's, that, that matters to me and my team. Um, and now that I have a little bit more support, uh, I can shift a little bit of my time then back to business development because I have to pay for these people to do their work. Archaeologists don't come cheap. <laughs> um, uh, again, I have a bunch more questions, but I'm wondering and hoping if anybody else out here in the audience has a question, and I'm going to put some added pressure on you, Shannon. Since we are live streaming it, I'm going to ask you to kind of run over Okay, so, y'all go, then I'll try to um, repeat it. So, since we're talking about entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism, um, I don't think anyone's really talked about monetization right now. Like, like, let me, I'm particularly interested in, like, what's the monetization aspect of working out, but, yeah, this, uh, is, this is critical to everything. Of course, money is pretty critical. So, the question from Shannon is talk a little bit about monetization and specifically to specifically I think to okay so I, I guess we're going to start off with Lemmy and we're talking about acquiring all these customers who are utilizing your app staying with your app contributing using where's monetization how do you guys pay the bills where's the revenue come from right um, good question I mean obviously yes no business can survive without revenue um, and at the moment, you can go into the App Store, you can download our app, it's free, you can, there are no limits, you can add as many lists as you want, you can share these things. Um, how, how, does, how do we turn that into money to pay staff? Um, on, on, a, on a basic level, to start with, well, we don't because we, we have some funding from some investors, so they keep us going until we get to the point where we're profitable. Um, but what, what's the plan? Okay, so if you think about um, travel planning nowadays, um, so I'm thinking about like when I first went traveling like 20 years ago, backpacking around places. In, in some ways it was much simpler, right? You would get your copy of the, the Lonely Planet Eastern Europe or the Rough Guide Southeast Asia and you would get on a bus or a train and you'd arrive in a place and you'd look up and you find, okay, here are the attractions here, here are some hostels, here are some restaurants. Nowadays there are so, there's so much more information, right? If I'm traveling to um, Kuala Lumpur, um, I can go online and I can find 200,000 trip advisory reviews for different places. I can find 100 people who have written blog articles. I can type Kuala Lumpur into Instagram and find millions of beautiful photos of things that I want to go. What do I actually do if I'm going to Kuala Lumpur? Is I call up my friend um, and say, hey Bob, like you used to live in Kuala Lumpur, or you live there now, like what, what should I go see? What are the cool places to do? So. In practice, although there is all this information out there on the web, it's so fragmented that people get overwhelmed and that's not actually how they plan their travel. Um, so the idea, what we're thinking out with Lemmy is that by providing a platform where people can tell us where they want to travel, tell us their wish list, tell us their bucket list, um, tell us all the places in the world they'd like to go, um, we capture that information and then we have a lot more in idea of your, your intent. Like what, what does the user want to go? Where are the, what are their interests? Where are they planning to go? If you go onto a website like um, TripAdvisor or Booking.com to book something, at that point you've already made up your mind. Like you've probably decided where to go already. We're trying to capture people earlier in the kind of customer journey. So by, by capturing all that information which people are volunteering to us by using our travel tools, we hopefully build up much more of a, like a better travel profile. Once we have that, we're able to, to give you um, targeted deals, targeted um, products. So if we know that you, you, you'd like to go to Tokyo one day and visit a restaurant, and we can do a deal where we find you a, a flight in a hotel, or maybe you know, maybe we partner with, with other companies that are providing like, you know, sustainable tours or interesting things. Because we have all that background information on you, we, we can target much more, much more closely. 
So the idea, a big idea is by, by capturing people earlier in the customer journey and gathering more information, we can be much more targeted in, in terms of our recommendations of what in the long run we will sell to you and make money. Uh, Johnny and Michael, do you want to talk on monetization? It's a little more straightforward with you guys, but if you have something you want to add. So yeah, monetization, of course, uh, you know, um, even though the social aspect is so important, but the problem is in the social sector, NGOs, uh, they don't provide competitive salaries often to the young talents drop coming from the universities. So, and uh, as a, we are a for-profit company, we have to make that straight, right? Um, and we want to pay good salaries. This is, you know, my responsibility as an entrepreneur. And our tours have a price, um, so people are willing to pay for it. It's we don't compete on price with other competitors. Uh, the price that is a little bit higher, uh, but we provide high value. Um, and uh, so that revenue stream from the selling tours keeps um, uh, covers the expenses and allows us gradually to to, to grow. Yeah. Uh, that's that's basically. And John, if you want to add something, yeah. ours is kind of similar. I mean, essentially, we're an adventure tour company, like I said, with a sustainable development angle. So, for us, what we've done with our journey is, for example, when we built a kindergarten in Cambodia, which was our second project that we had ever run, um, we got absolutely fleeced by this dodgy English guy who helped install the concrete for ten times the price. And as our journey. Uh, moves forward, we understand where the price point should be and also it's allowed us to scale. For example, I was in Kenya last week and um, we ran, for the first time we ran two trips back to back. We were building a school with a Maasai community outside of Rusha near Kilimanjaro and we did one trip and then we did another trip literally three days later which allowed us to scale our cost so it reduces our cost but we keep the ticket price the same for both trips which increases our margin which allows us to run more trips, hire more staff and do more projects. Uh, just out of curiosity, Johnny, did anybody sign up for both trips by any chance? Just, well, we were partnering with, uh, for any of the, the ladies in the audience here, there's a Facebook group called Girls Love Travel. Mm -hmm. So she, the owner of the group, came on both trips. Okay. That's all. That and me and Josh. That counts. Yeah. 40 American women for a month. It was hard work. <laughs> <laughs> could, could I ask a question to the other panelists? Is that allowed? Sure. I, I, I think it is. I'm kind of curious, because, so both of you have... Um, kind of social enterprises or like things that are encouraging sustainable tourism. Um, there's, a, there's a general trend that, um, particularly as like more younger people are traveling, people who want to have like more authentic experiences. How do you show that you are for real? Because it's so easy for any tour company to slap a label on the website saying, you know, we promote local stuff, we're sustainable, we're authentic. How do you actually show that in what you do rather than just show that this is like greenwashing or a marketing label? This is, that's such a good point because I'm sure you guys are aware there's such a dirty word in the industry of the, the concept of volunteerism and then uh, this, the new term of white saviorism and um, that's everything that we don't represent but for sure that you run the risk of getting tarred with that brush but if you're trying to do something genuine then you've got to just take the hit for the greater good, right? Like we know what we do, all our projects that we run um, are planned almost a year in advance so we liaise with our partner NGO, with the community directly. They choose what they want our funding to go to. We have local engineers, local providers, local staff, and then our uh, travelers essentially go there and add the finishing touches, the painting and the furnishing. But really we're witnessing what work's gone on before. But to differentiate yourself from the, the grimy industry is, is a tough one to do. Again, through influencer marketing, we believe that if you're bringing on people who are also follow the same belief system as you and the same moral code as you, then their, my audience, for example, and the, the influencers that we'll work with on each trip, their audiences should also then be able to trust the people that they're following in the same way that my followers can trust me. And then that would set you apart from just the, the, the mainstream white saviorism, which has destroyed the industry, to be honest. Yeah, very important point, of course, you know, because uh, if you, I even also deleted the terms like social entrepreneurship because you make your, you expose yourself to a lot of criticism, and I have to say, you know, like the you know to sell to make money, you also need to sometimes simplify the message to the consumer. So people come to have a good time, they come to have fun, right? So you need to have a product that appeals to them, while also maybe not maybe, but also but also being connected to a bigger purpose or bigger message. So it, it you know there is certain grades. So we have let's say the Bangkok Starters Tour. 
which is an you know, epic combination of different aspects, what makes Bangkok such a great city, but then it goes all the way down to, let's say, Chinatown and Plaque, which is a heritage walk. And how I work is I have three pillars. Um, the first one is, uh, of course, the experience. But, uh, everything is centered around people, so humans. So I have a, I'm working on a new platform called Hyperlocal, which is not like humans of New York, but uh, it portrays people that inspire our work. It can be the opinions of the 90-year-old grandma in the alleys to um, you know, social innovators, to community leaders, civil society. But every story is connected to an experience uh, that you can experience on Bangkok Vanguards. And uh, through that research process, um, getting the information from the people, we also get an understanding of the needs and the situations. So we tag that to another platform called the Bangkok Heritage Week, which showcases projects and uh, initiatives uh, from the grassroots that uh, you know help to uh, protect and preserve the cultural heritage in, in communities. So that this triangle of people, their projects and their aspirations and the experience is something that uh, we keep on you know uh, telling uh, the people. Because for me, it's yeah raising awareness, understanding, and building empathy. And even the Bangkok Heritage Week is not so much for the tourists, it's more for Thai people because it's their heritage, it's their story. And um, so, but again, these initiatives are just like the Bangkok Heritage Week started in April. But uh, yeah, and then of course it's the people that come on the tour. So on the tour, let's say on the Night Rider, we don't go into a restaurant, we have dinner, but we integrate local families. So like uh, one person is a motorcycle driver, retired police, um, army officer, but he's an, I call him the, um, you know, Gordon Ramsay of Tonbury because he has been cooking since he was eight and so we, we integrate families, we integrate community initiatives at the bottom line but beyond that we try to go on the online realm to educate the public and ourselves and you know, yeah. And this happened by chance but as we know Give Back Giveaway and Bangkok Vanguard are socially conscious firms. Actually Lemmy Travel is socially conscious as well. Matt, touch on how you, as a travel app, are doing your part. Yep, so um, the, ori the original name for Lemmy was actually Finds, F-I-N-D-S, um, because uh, one of our original concepts is like finding these, like, finds are these little local hidden gems within a city. So not the big chains that you find anywhere else, but like your small mom and pop businesses. Um, and we want to kind of help those businesses. Um, so, um, and that's why I was kind of interested to hear as well about these, you know, how do you genuinely show that you are, um, you know, encouraging this kind of sustainable tourism? And I think it's all about finding like the, the right partners and the right the right people to work with. So um, what we're doing currently on a kind of a city by city basis is trying to find these businesses um, that share our values. So it might be just like a small restaurant um, that you know uses mostly local ingredients or or hires people from underrepresented communities um, and give them like a voice in our platform um, and we can promote them or within our platform on social media and so on. Uh, we can also do kind of deals. So we're working with some businesses in Manila. And so if, if, you, um, if you like or comment to one of these businesses on our platform, uh, we'll give you a, um, uh, a special deal, that thing like a discount or you know, buy three, get a fourth free. Um, so I think um, if, you can be, if you can build a platform that lets other, other small businesses who share your values um, help themselves, um, that also allows you to do more good than you could just do on a, a purely online platform yourself. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And I'm going to go back to the audience. Thank you, Shannon, for that first question in Breaking the Ice. Do we have anybody else with a question on their mind? Do, 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 are you more adventurous than Shannon? Come up to the mic. You won't be on camera. Sorry, is it based mostly on your experiences from traveling around the world before? And then how do you do the operations around the world? Like how do you facilitate, you know, who's going to kind of do the groundwork before you get there? So originally our first three or four projects were all based in Southeast Asia because Give Back Giveaway is based in Bangkok and, and uh, Josh and myself both live here. So 
originally it was in Thailand, Cambodia. We, we do a lot of work with the Burmese migrants slash refugees and they saw it as well. And that was just through experience, through friends of friends, through our own travels in, uh, in Southeast Asia. But as we've grown, then obviously we've, we've branched further afield and now we've got projects in Turkey and, and Uganda and all around the world. That is a long process for us. So if, for example, like all our projects for 2020 are already organized and um, underway, the liaison period, working out what we want, how we're going to fund it, this, the, the payment, because we drip feed the funding for each project rather than, of course, just delivering um, in one shot. So now we're already starting to think about 2021. So it's really like an 18 month process. We have to, we have, oh, thankfully we've got Petch now who's sitting at the back, who does a lot of our research for us. So we dig out local NGOs who've got rep reputations online and we speak to them all extensively for months in advance. Then we work out, do we believe that we can trust them? And hopefully we can, we build this rapport with them. And then once we've identified a community when we've done one project with that's gone really well, for example, in Cambodia and in, in, on the Burmese border and in Arusha where we just come from and now in Turkey where we have uh, great connections. Once we've got a partner NGO that we know we can completely trust and they're now our friends, then that's a project that we'll continue to go back for indefinitely. And we would love to get to a situation then that we run, let's say one country per month, but multiple trips in that country. So we would just have 12 partners that we can trust entirely. And then we wouldn't need to do this blind outreach anymore. And we're well on the way to doing that. We've probably got five that we now know very well inside out, like personal friends. So hopefully in the next two or three years, we'll have that just all lined up. But it's really a 12 to 18 month process. And it's scary because you have to trust people on the internet. And every, every mother has told you not to do that before. I've had what, sir? Have you had repeat customers? Yeah, we have. It's crazy, actually. The industry average is maybe 20%, and we have about 75%. And people who come on our trips come back because you can feel you're really making a difference. And you go on other trips, you talk about social development, and they visit orphanages for an hour, and you think, well, this doesn't feel so nice. And really, when you come on one of our trips, you really feel it. You know that the project's so worthwhile. You can see your money's getting spent on something that's really beneficial to a grassroots community. And then the adventure part is real adventure. Obviously, I've been to every country in the world, and I know what adventure is. So our itineraries are pretty wild. So you do something genuinely good for your soul, and then go crazy for two weeks. So yeah, we got a lot of people coming back. Awesome. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Danielle. Can you repeat that before you answer, please? So are you basically asking, do we follow up on the projects yeah, that we've done? Maybe work towards, so if there's a community that you've worked with yeah. that needs 10 schools yeah, or yeah, yeah. whatever it is, have you got a long-term aim to work with them in that kind of way? Or? Josh is bored of me talking about this, but what I really want to happen is for us to have 12 communities that we work with. So we work a lot just outside the huge refugee camp in Mesot, for example, um, and there's a former Bur Burmese refugee who's our pr project coordinator there. And we've done two projects and two more coming up with him. And my dream personally is that we would have 12 communities, like I just said to Danielle, that we would go back to each year. And we would just focus on that community over a decade or so, where you can really feel the impact. Do we follow up? Of course we do. And we send now quarterly, I think, updates um, on how the school's progressing. What we don't do is go in and say, these guys need an internet cafe and build them an internet cafe. And there's no wires and no teachers. So we, we improve on existing uh, infrastructure. So we'll improve their kindergarten or build their dormitory, rebuild their dormitory. So there's never any additional expense to the community that wasn't there prior to our work. Um, but to answer your question, what I would really love us to do is to work specifically with one community every year or hopefully multiple times per year so that in 10 years time, that entire community will have been transformed, whether that's malaria clinics, dormitories, playgrounds, sports fields, small schools, and then eventually internet cafes and things like, things like this. So 10 years down the line, these kids who previously were stuck in the cycle of poverty can really have full access to every facet that they would need from a modern society to allow them to break that cycle of, uh, of poverty. And that's what we're hoping to work towards as we try to identify regular partners. 
sounds like a sounds like an awesome comprehensive long-term plan. Really impressive. Uh, thanks for the question. Any other questions from the audience? I guess it's going to default for me until you guys. Oh, Dude, sorry. And this is Ian Cumming, founder of Travel Massive. Hi guys. Um, two quick questions. Where are your companies in, or organizations incorporated? Against it. Where where are your businesses incorporated? Incorporated in the yeah. uh, Registered? Oh, okay, sorry. Registered business, yeah. Um, ben, Thailand, Bangkok. Let me just sit here. Locally. For us, it's Hong Kong. Because it's just much easier. Uh, for us, it's also Hong Kong. Um, although we also have an office in Manila, uh, which is where our main, our main kind of dev and marketing teams are based. Okay. But HQ in, in Hong Kong. And I've got uh, one last question for Michael. Um, so I had uh, Lisa in our team um, was watching in on our live stream and uh, she's in uh, Berlin. So she has a German question for you, which is, um, but no, I won't ask it in German, but um, she wants to know why, you, why your tours uh, resonate particularly well with German travelers and what age group are they? Okay. Um so the particular group that comes to you know to us, they are very the cur of a curious nature. The they are not young, so we are not like you know backpackers beginning twenties. Usually, already have families. They have good jobs. I would say the average age is like mid thirties. So we have people like if they're young, they're like late twenties. It's young, um, and I think that closeness to the people, the diversity. The basically the, 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 the emphasis, you know, on the magic of the ordinary things and the untold stories, and so we design it in a way that always keeps people engaged. So I don't want to have this lull uh, throughout the day because our experiences are quite intense. So the Bangkok 360 starts at eight, and sometimes you know we end at six. So people ask me, what the heck are you doing, like in Bangkok for ten hours, right? Um, so, but the time goes by like this, and this is a matter of a question of the design of the experience to incorporate many, many elements. I think, Michael, when you were giving an overview earlier, you said something like 60% of your clients are from Germany. Mm -hmm. Why is such a large proportion of your clients are from that country? I think there are certain uh, Thailand fan communities, people that are repetitive customers. So we have a lot of people coming to us who know Bangkok already and uh, uh, who love Thailand. So they want to experience something different um, and then they get to hear from others. Also first timers, of course, right? But people go back and they say, if you go to Bangkok, you know, you have to contact Michael and Sunny because, you know, um, so we have become for a group of people, go-to people here in Bangkok if they want to have, um, you know, an experience outside the tourism attractions. Awesome. Any questions again from out in the audience? So, oh, we're going to switch to Matt. He is I, I, I'm going to ask myself and Johnny a follow-up from Ian's question, because he asked about where we were, where we were based. Um, although Thailand is like a major tourism hub, one of the most visited countries in the world, um, a lot of travel startups do not headquarter themselves in Thailand. They prefer to HQ in a place like Singapore or Hong Kong. Why is that, and what changes could the Thai government make to policy in order to make Thailand a travel startup friendly place? John. Thanks. <laughs> uh, do you know that there's a, a, a digital nomad visa system in Estonia, for example? Have you heard about that? And there's, I think, per capita, Chiang Mai, Bangkok, and also in Bali are the three highest uh, percentage of digital nomad communities in the world. Um, and what Estonia have done, they've opened up a visa prospect where if you work online, something like what we do, um, they allow you to, for I think 100 euro or the equivalent, um, register yourself, pay minimal tax, but some tax in the hope that the next Uber or Airbnb or something will be registered in Estonia, which is an amazing thing to do. What a lot of people in Thailand do, um, I heard, was... <laughs> circumnavigate the visa system with various means um, while registering in, in, a, in a financial ecosystem that is less paperwork heavy 
and more tax friendly, which is certainly something that I would help would would help any burgeoning company. Yeah. Yeah. To answer my own question, I, I mean, I very much agree with you. We need obviously a reduction in paperwork, like the process of applying for visas um, and setting up your company in Thailand is far worse than in neighbouring countries. Um, additionally, I think um, the difference between, let's say, the government in a place like Estonia and here is um, everything here is very siloed and broken up into many different agencies. So if you do want to set up here, you know, you, you're talking to the BOI, the Board of Investment, you're talking to like the Ministry of Labour and the Tax Bureau and the Prime Minister's Office, and every different government agency has its own policies and its own things. So although, you know, I, I totally believe that the, the heart of the government is in the right place when it comes to encouraging startup in practice, because immigration is saying one thing and the Tax Bureau is saying another thing, um, getting all of that to work together is really hard. So until there is more like cooperation between all the different government agencies, you know, it's still going to be really tough for um, Thailand to attract more travel startups, tech startups. I also think I also think they're really missing a trick because Thailand is such an attractive destination for digital nomads. They could make if they were to if they were to introduce a visa that allowed someone to pay, let's say, for argument's sake, fifteen percent tax or ten percent, because ten percent of something is better than a hundred percent of nothing, which is what they currently get. And a quick reminder from the immigration department, all forongs, please fill out your TM30. Any other questions in the audience before? Uh, one more, go ahead. I'm going to repeat the question. So the question is, great question, is you're dealing with foreign customers. You're talking about the challenge of having your employees who are licensed, poor guys.